So what's to be expected uh, in the next 45 minutes or so? Just, you know, assure you're in the wrong session and the right session here. So you will get an experience report from a case that I was involved in like for 14 months or so during the most of last year. And I will tell you about coaching tools we've been using and you might get a few tips there maybe to apply them yourselves in your own context. Um, and I'll do quite some reflections, so like what did the organization learn, um, but also for me as a coach, you know, what did I learn and, you know, looking back, you're, almost, you're always a lot smarter and it seems very obvious. So with Al, you know, I'll give you the whole story and then look back and see what we learned. What this talk is not about, uh, it's not a safe intro. So, I mean, I will touch a bit on safe and you'll see, you know, how it uh, linked, but if you expect this, then you're in the wrong talk, I'm afraid. Okay, good. So what's it all about? So the company is a private bank based in, in Germany and they uh, have a rather big IT organization. They have 300 people, you know, it's very classic um, private bank, you know, highly regulated. So they run their own data center, they have their custom applications, all of this stuff. So you need people to operate this. And they're split into a development department and an operations department. This will become important in a, in a little bit. Okay, so 300 people development and operations. So we'll start the story at the very end. So in this picture here you see a very mixed uh, group of people from that organization, they're all from IT. There's like the release train engineer, QAs, project managers, sys admins, you know. Nice mix. Um, it was taken in February when I did the KMP1 class with them. So that was really cool. At the beginning of this year um, I had this private um, KMP class, so KMP1 and KMP2 with them, and they have now eight or ten KMPs in their organization, which is really cool. And so this is where they are today, so this is March, so it's probably evolved a little bit, so just so they get an impression. So that's kind of the, so they call it the IT operations portfolio board, so that's a little bit like that, that gives the heartbeat for the whole system. And let's zoom a little bit in, so you see here they have lanes per team, so they have like a dozen teams um, working there. <clears throat> they have clear pull criteria, you know, what, how to pull stuff through the workflow. Um, they have VIP limits per team now. That is rather fresh. Hasn't been this all the time. You'll see the story. Um, yeah, and they have rather rich tickets now. They've standardized the tickets. And they do have blockers. So that's the IT operations portfolio board. Oh, pretty solid. And what they also have, like the corresponding team boards. And here you see an example of this. Um, you recognize the white um, uh, um, tickets from the portfolio board. These are the ones. So they correspond and they are breaking down further on the team boards. So they have quite a few of these. So this is um, yeah, roughly where they are today. And they are also um, currently, you know, they're starting this, this upstream stuff. Because they know that they do have an issue there as well. It's like, ooh, where do all these white tickets come from? And so, hmm. Okay, so we have their epics and features, and I'll give you a few more details. So just to give you an impression of that's kind of the, the current state in this organization as of today. So looking at the camera maturity model, you've seen this a few times, I guess, over the past days. Um, so I think today they're pretty solid on uh, maturity level two. So they really, you know, I think they have a pretty consistent and defined process now to deliver, but they do have still some inconsistencies and still sometimes the customer um, is dissatisfied. And they also have some uh, maturity level three patterns emerging, which is really cool. So they're really moving towards service orientation and they're doing much more with metrics now. But they're definitely not there yet. And you've seen uh, in the big model, you see that there's this gap between level two and three, you know, and this is what they need to cross. <clears throat> so where did they come from when, uh, when I joined them? So they were really a very classic level one shop, you know. They had all this work pushed into the teams and onto personal desks of the, 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 the individual people, right? Um, prioritization was mainly done on political leverage. So, you know, you can imagine private banking, very classic, very masculine type of culture also. Um, and the teams and the people are really overloaded. And the teams were running pretty well, but they definitely didn't align across the teams. You know, so they had really their local optima and their local sub-optima. So um, 
let's rewind to the start. You've seen the, the step that they made. So what do you think? How long did it take? For this journey? You know, you should have. <laughs> Year and a half? Yeah. That's roughly right. So let's rewind. OK, that's a little bit ugly. OK, to 2016. So, so that I don't lose you here. So we're going back now in time and see where this thing started. OK? So at the beginning of 2016, they kicked off this innovation program. OK? So they said, oh, we need to have better innovative capability because they used to be a pretty uh, a very innovative IT organization, um, and they kind of, you know, uh, stalled a little bit. And they said, okay, we want to be this cool, um, innovative organization again. And of course, we want to increase performance. I think you've heard this before, right? So we need to get more stuff done faster. Um, also, we want to be, uh, be, be better um, able to steer our efforts in the organization. And so this was um, the direction given by partners. And one of the partners said something like, I want to have the coolest IT in the finance world or something. OK. So how? How did they want to pursue this? Of course, let's make our IT agile. I'm sure you have heard this before. And so as a first step, they said, let's start with the development group. So not the operations group, but the development group. And they formed this. Um, cross-functional team, really like a well, classic um, agile transition. Um, and the first thing they did, they created this vision. And this is, we will revolutionize the finance world. So that's what they used for their transition to come up. And they selected um, SAFE, so Scaled Agile Framework, as their framework of the choice. So they had a look at other things. You probably uh, know the other usual suspects. And I asked them later why, why they decided for SAFE, and they said, well, they really perceived it as a simple framework to scale their organization and get alignment within the organization. So these were the, the key factors there. And so they said, OK, so let's implement these structure, these processes and artifacts from SAFE. And so during 2016, they did this SAFE transformation within the development part of the organization. So they established several programs. Um, uh, they started doing Scrum with the teams, the development teams, and it worked out pretty nicely, OK? So we're at the end of 2016 now, and the pressure was increasing on the IT operations side of things. So imagine you run an operations team in a private bank. What do you think might be their challenges? Any idea what are they facing? What's their business like? Uh -huh. There's always lots of stuff to do. What else? Yeah, they have like lots of security regulative stuff. Yeah. And of course, you know, they always need to respond quickly. Because you know, when you run a private bank and don't respond quickly enough to a ticket, it might cost you a lot of money. You know. And depending on the culture of the organization, it might even cost your job. Okay. And you have this, you know, in Kanban speak, you have a really high share of irrefutable demand, you know, like all these support tickets arising, you can't just say no. And of course, unplanned demand, right? You cannot plan your outages or when your um, users will have issues. So that's like how their business was, or still is. And so it was becoming actually a bit worse because the development side of the organization, they had switched to this agile thing, you know, and they were releasing more often and, you know, they needed stuff more quickly. Like, hey, we need this virtual machine and if you don't get it by then, we will miss our sprint goal and whatever, you know. So, and the pressure was increasing even more on them. And so, okay, they made the announcement. Operations will become agile as well. Unfortunately, at that point, they hadn't given like a lot of motivation or explanation why. So they decided towards the end of 2016 that they will basically take the blueprint from the development organization, which they perceived as pretty successful, and then just apply this to the operations part of the organization. Okay? So this was at the end of 2016. So you see here a little, uh, that's this, the safe hierarchy they had in place. So in Dev, they had this up and running, and they formed these three programs in the operations department. So they have infrastructure, front end, back end, and then client services. So pretty classic cut. And they had these roles established. They called them product leads and skill and people leads per program that were the leader, the leader positions for each of these three programs. 
Good. So I came in and with a colleague, um, Sven, um, came in uh, in February 2017. And our, operation, uh, our uh, mission was shift the teams to Kanban. So Kanbanize the team. Three teams. So we were down there at the team level. You see, we had six of these teams and two of the programs. So one program was lagging behind because they hadn't filled the product and skill and people lead positions yet. So they had, uh, I think they hired them from the outside of the organization. Um, so we started with these two programs at first. So, so it sounded all pretty straightforward. You know, you have this organization a structure and you know, just make the teams. To Kanban, and you know, a few of you probably start thinking, "Yeah, that sounds like that aesthetic, you know, do some workshops, and then you're done." Okay, that's kind of what we thought at this point as well. So we'll see how this turned out. <laughs> and a funny little side note here: um, one morning, uh, Sven and I we were standing there, and we were looking around. So where are all the safe consultants? So, hmm, no one was there anymore. So they said, like, I don't know, it's just you know, just go with what you have and make it work. So. So our uh, strategy was okay that we comply with the structure that had been in place that had been put in place, you know. But no one could expect us to take the safe flag and run with it, you know. So um, yeah, we certainly complied, uh, but we didn't, you know, do a lot more actively with safe. We should really just, you know, we used what was there, and then put Kanban on it. Good. So we started to pull the levers, and I put this image in here because they were using all these mechanic metaphors, and I think they really thought like, yeah, we'll, so they had this plan, and I think they thought like, in November 2017, we'll be done with the transition, and we'll be agile, because you just need to switch these teams to Kanban, and then all will be fine. Okay, so we started, and you know, we did a classic thing, so you know, we did this half-day workshops, understanding Kanban, here you see the guys playing Fitcherban. And so basically we uh, had all the guys from the IT ops organization, I think 80 or so, we did a few of these um, half day workshops. <clears throat> and so that they all had, an, uh, you know, they got the first feeling, so how, what's this Kanban thing and how can our job look like using Kanban, okay. And then um, we did this here, I think there was just a call, a, a talk from Travis over there about static. So who of you is using static or running? you. So um, it's a proven model a process how you can actually you know design good Kanban systems that stick and it's very humane in its approach and you have these um, six stages here that we cover and you know for me as a coach static is always great because once you're through a static workshop with your teams or with the department you just know how they tick you know you know their work you know their issues you have a really good grasp on you know who you're working with it's really cool and also for the, the people involved there, they are always positively surprised. Because at the beginning they think, oh yeah, of course, I know what we're doing and how we do it. But it turns out that everyone has their own picture of how, how they work, right? And so combining this and coming up with a joint one is really, really helpful. So highly recommended if you come, need to come up with a new Kanban system or you want to revive one of your zombie systems, you can use this also you know, from the bottom up. Good, so that's what we did. We started with one or two teams, so we had a pilot team, pilot team and another early adopter team, and we did static, and it went pretty well. And then we wanted to do this with the other teams, and we started to engage in other teams, and suddenly we felt like, ooh, something's wrong here. So our borders were not as calm anymore. And um, so we got a, quite a little bit of friction in our work, and it all seemed to crystallize with these roles. So there was the announcement or the order that we had to fill these roles. An agile master, a product owner, and a solution architect. Because these roles turned out to be really successful in the development area, right? And that's what they had on their little building plan for their safe structure. And so um, we had these situations and the teams, you know, we said, okay, so who of you would like to be the agile master? And, hmm. But they simply refused, the teams refused to fill the roles. So this was really a very strong sign of resistance. And it wasn't due to lack of skills or availability. I mean, they have great people in the teams, you know. It, uh, it turned out that they actually had several candidates and really good candidates for each of these roles. But some of them, you know, they just refused and said, no, we will not do this, okay? So we as coaches, you know, we had to get out our first eight 
suitcase and you know think, oh, what's what's going on here? And uh, one night I was going uh, home on my way to the U-Bahn, and um, I had this picture in front of my mind. So that was my expectation. You know, I'm always an optimist. You know, in China, you know, you get there, you start where you are, you nice evolutionary change, right? And then uh, see that you you know help the organization to grow and improve. But uh, turned out uh, it was like this. They were already in the dip, you know, and this big ugly change curve. This is the Virginia Satter change curve. Oh, sorry, German. Um, yeah, and we here we met all this resistance. So, and I think they were not really in chaos yet. I think they were, but they were definitely on the way down there, because through the safe context that we had, you know, they had initiated this reorganization. And although they had kept the teams largely intact, so they just moved a few people here and there, they had changed all the leadership positions. And it turned out that after this, you know, with the new organization, they had even more leadership positions than before. So you couldn't even say that it was Selena or whatever. So um, there was actually a lot of um, frustration going on, you know, with these role changes. And it's like, oh, what's going to happen with my team leads? And of course, the team leads were concerned, like, what's going to happen with me? And the teams were just generally a little bit frustrated and pissed off. And and the second thing uh, that we had there was that this whole agile thing, they didn't understand us. They said, we're ops, we're fast. So what, why do we need to do this agile thing? We are fast already. So the, the communication really hadn't been very good. You know, like, why are we doing this? You know, what's, what's the objective of, of this whole um, transformation? And they really felt, yeah, yeah, we have to do it because the, the deaf guys do this over there. So what it turns out, so that was our actual pathway that I'll describe in the future until December 2017. You know, we started there and then we moved our way out of the, out of the valley again. So um, how we responded to this once we became aware of this, so we really, really were stepping on the brake. So I said, come on, we need to take a step back here. It's not, you know, we cannot push further uh, with the Kanban implementation if we have these, all these basic things up. So uh, one thing we did, we split up the, the static workshops in smaller parts. That's generally recommendable. That's a good risk mitigation strategy. You know, don't schedule a two-day thing in advance or a whole day. Just do it step by step, because then you can also respond better as a coach to unexpected things that come up. Um, and we got a lot of involvement with top with top management. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, what's your reasoning behind this? What are the motivations for the change? And how can we communicate this better? So there's, there have been also some town hall meetings and stuff as a response to this and more direct uh, communication with these program leads and their teams. And we did this whole, you know, there was a lot of then classic agile <coughs> coaching stuff, like what is agility? And you know, what out of these values? So what resonates with you? What do you think can make a difference? So we did a lot of workshops with the teams. So, you know, first of all, to explore what agility is. And then, you know, weeks, months later, uh, later we uh, managed to fill the roles. Took a little bit. Okay. So as one result, we did these immersion workshops. So we played Flow Lab with some key players. And like here in this picture you see, so there is like one of the guys is the CIO of the organization. We had the release train engineers and a few of these um, program leads. Yeah, Boris? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the three roles. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, no, we couldn't. So that was a no, 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 no. You know, we had to go with what we had and, yeah, not introduce anything else. Okay, so that was really cool, these workshops. And I think in, this, in these workshops, they really understood what Kanban is. And so it really resonated with them. They understood their role in this whole thing. You know, with FlowLab, they get a really good understanding of, you know, what, what does this pull thing and how does it impact me? And, but I think the biggest uh, takeaway there was they understood that Kanban is not just something you do to your team down there, right? I think they really get an idea like, oh, this is cool. This can help me in my job as a manager. So I think um, this was a big um, door opener for stuff to come. So, and I think um, 
could build up a lot of trust with these guys. So I think they got a lot of confidence uh, in Kanban. And it's like, oh, OK, that's the thing we bought here, you know, that we signed up to do. Because I think they had a very, very simplistic idea, you know, like this is the thing that you do in your teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's more the operations side. But you see here, this one, um, these are actually a few guys from the dev um, area. So when they heard that there are like Kanban folks in the house, so they also, we get a lot of pull from their side. So we helped a few teams um, on a little site thingy there to, uh, to switch to Kanban. OK, here are a few impressions from the static workshops. You know, lots of sticky notes and flip shirts and you name it. And looking all a bit messy, um, but later on, you know, you get all these shiny boards, you know. They were popping up all over the place. Um, and, and, and a tip here, never ever as a coach build their board. You know, it will be a lot prettier if you do it yourself because you have the nice Neuland pants and maybe you can visualize. And, uh, but then, if I do it, and I did it in the past and I learned my lesson, it was always Susanna's board. And I don't want it to be Susanna's board, it's their board, right? And you know, we want to make the hurdles really low so that they change it. You know, the system should be flexible. And, and also, don't make it too shiny. <laughs> you know, because no one will dare to touch it. Oh, can I take this wonderful thing off? Yeah, you can, you know. Don't make it too shiny. And you know, you probably notice it'll take, uh, particularly in the first weeks, it'll take a little bit for the board to settle down. So, and, and I personally, in static, I always go for, you know, if I'm not sure, I just go for the, the simpler option, right? And then see if it needs to be more complex or complicated later on. Good. So one size does not fit all. Just a few examples of boards. And we really had this spectrum, like this one to the right. I think that's the, the network support team. They had a, like a real pull system, you know. They did date stamping. They had their blockers and external weighting and everything. And here, that's a very proto Kanban board. <clears throat> and uh, that I, I took this image in December when I did my goodbye rounds through the organization. And they were really happy with the board because it helped them so much. You know, they have this very elaborate workflow. They are highly specialized. And you see, yeah, it's a ton of VIP. But hey, at least now they have an overview of what's going on. And they actually started to work a bit more um, together. So the, the, the really detailed workflow also helped them um, to generalize more, you know, help each other and collaborate. Yeah, so I think that's also an, an anti-pattern. Don't, you know, don't take a board and say to the team, so that's your template, just fill it out, you know. No, 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 they're very different. Okay, so we had the Kanban systems for the teams all set up and we had the roles filled, so was our job done? Maybe on paper, right? We could have said, yep, yeah, we're done. However, during our work there, we had all of these things. You know, we were working with the teams, and from time to time, stuff was hitting us or hitting the teams on their heads. What's going on here? That's a weird team, okay. And it turned out there was a lot of other things in the air that suddenly hit you. And uh, these were these kind of things, like these were larger initiatives. And we kind of, we had identified them during static, you know, there was this work item type initiatives, but they were just very unpredictable in the way that they arrived at the system. So they were just falling down out of the air. So this was this whole topic of the portfolio management. So we went around an organization and asked, okay, so how do you manage these things? I mean, of course, and they manage their projects individually within the projects. Um, but the question is, how do you manage them overall? And that's the answer we got. It's like, whoo, there was nothing there, right? So one of the project managers started to do this Excel sheet. And that was the basis for the portfolio board you would see early at the very start, right? Um, and um, we got a pretty quick um, agreement by the management and support. And we said, OK, we need to address this issue because, you know, the day-to-day -day business was running, was running really well in the team, but this portfolio staff was really a, a big source of dis dissatisfaction, and it was totally out of control. So in this meeting, that was June, you know, you see the time scale, this takes time. <laughs> um, we met with the release train engineers and a few 
um, of the program leads. And the RTE explained the safe hierarchy. So that's the actual flip chart that he brought. And you see, like, they have these initiatives. These are rather cloudy, big ideas. Um, then they break it down to epics. And I think it's the safe thing, right? So one epic needs to relate uh, or can uh, impact several programs. And then so you break the epic down into features. And each feature sits in exactly one of these programs. So this, the good thing is it has very clear ownership. So you can assign a feature. You know, it has a program lead um, as the owner for this. And then within the program, you break down the features into user stories that sit in exactly one team. So these are also the work item types um, that you've seen at the team boards and on their portfolio board. OK, so in the meeting, uh, that's my scribbling over here. Uh, so we tried to make this hierarchy and <laughs> move it into flow. So it's like, OK, I uh, draw this funnel and like, OK, so you see some examples of stuff there. So whoa, 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 you know, what happens with these initiatives? And you know, where are approval or commitment points? And you know, we tried to identify the flow. OK, and this was actually the basis for the IT portfolio board. Um, and uh, so the meeting went really well. I was a bit nervous, like, oh, I hope we're not too drastic there. But it totally resonated with them. And we just suggested, OK, so let's visualize the whole mess. You know, let's see what's going on here. And so um, in July, early July, uh, you see um, a few of the guys. We did our first iteration of the board. Uh, based on the scribble here, we put it um, on the wall. And in this inaugural meeting, that's how it looks like. OK, so yeah, still a bit sad. You know, it's really empty. And when you left it, you know, we didn't put any lines there. We said, OK, let's see how this uh, works out. And you see here these yellow stickies. These were the epics identified from the Excel sheet. So we basically wrote um, stickies for, the, uh, for groups of lines. OK, so this is how it all started. And there were actually a few fe features already uh, in progress. You see it in the timestamp, just correctly how it evolved. July, color coding, features get started. Um, oops, that's August. You see it uh, filling up a little bit, which is good. That's the point when I left uh, for my vacation. And I was a bit nervous, like, oh, OK, I would look like when I return. <laughs> uh, this is in September. Oh, the thing is moved here. OK, um, after I came back from, from a few weeks in northern Sweden. And you see, that's typical effect, all the submarines had surfaced, right? You've probably seen this happening. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, while we're at this, I also have this thing going on, and let's put a sticky on. So um, the board, at least this side, really started filling. And then um, we created my most favorite part of the board. Yeah, it, uh, it just got moved. So that was basically, these were waiting, and these are the ones in progress. Because what we did there, we used this trick. You know, initially, you cannot do like whip limits, but just play with the physical space. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, there's not more space for more of these yellows. So which one should go on the board? You know, it's kind of limiting whip already. OK, so at the, that was the really good thing. Postponed project, so they put the other thing off the, at the opposite wide, uh, uh, ball, wall, the other side of the aisle, which was really good for them. It was really like, oh, yeah, yeah, we really we can't do them at the moment. It's very helpful and healthy, I think. OK, this is in October. You see, it's all pretty nicely up and running. Um, November, nicely filled. You see here the pipeline. You know, that's the funnel. Just implemented the workflow from the funnel. <clears throat> and you know, this, the whole thing was alive and kicking. We had this nice um, camera meeting set up. So they were meeting once a, uh, once a week in front of the board for like 30 minutes. And it was moderated or facilitated by an internal project manager, so we coaches were not involved. I mean, of course, we were observing and giving feedback, but it wasn't our meeting anymore. What we did find out that the work was moving really, really slowly. But I'll get to this in a, in a second. Okay. So briefly, the, so this board, it was just about communicating. And it's always surprising. You stand there, and you watch the guys talk, and you think, there is no other place for you to, to share this, you know, this information. So they didn't have any other meeting or whatever set up to, to align on their initiatives. So th I think that was really the, uh, the big value. And also that it, it forced them to make decisions, right? Which of these yellow things go to the other side? 
Good. So, system for teams and roles and the portfolio board. So, are we done yet? So, let's see. Um, we're at the end of 2017 now, so that's also where the consulting and coaching contract ended because this official transition program was just scheduled until November. So, where are they at? So, they had this really nicely, I think it was a healthy mix of proto command system because we had also departments like a purchasing department was involved there as well. You know, and we had some real pull systems and they were really largely self-sustaining or they are now. So they just have maybe half a coach assigned to the whole of operations. So they're really, they run this on their own now. They have this proto kanban portfolio board. So in December they weren't, there were limits and so on, but they were in a good way. And um, we have some good starts for service orientation. So that was in December. Um, yeah, so what were the effects that they have? So they got a lot more transparency and they had empathy built up between the teams. I think that's pretty typical proto Kanban. And we were at least starting to rebuild trust, you know, through all this visibility and communication. And they got a much richer language to express their frustrations and issues. It was not just, oh, we have too much work. And, you know, all these bad guys, they give us all the work. They can express it in a much richer way now. And they got um, a lot of uh, learning, a lot more learnings about the actual capability of the organization. And this is what their capacities looked like. So you see two different versions, like a back end. They have a little bit of day-to-day -day business, but then a lot of general requests. And it's the other way around for the front end guys. Oops. And by the way, the, the blue stuff was all handled in JIRA because this was really fast moving. And they thought they could be doing innovation, but it turned out that this was wishful thinking. They couldn't do this on top of their current stuff without sacrificing the, the service levels they had established there. That's all, that was a big learning for them because they had hoped this to be different. <clears throat> okay, just briefly. We had towels on deck chairs. So you might have met some of my German fellows on your vacation, maybe, you know, and not only German students, but you know, once you see a deck chair, what do you do? You take a towel out and put it on the deck chair so that no one else can use the deck chair. Even if you maybe just return after sunset to get your towel, right? But it's your deck chair. And that's what we had with the epics. So, you know, it's like, oh, great, I have my lane now and I'm not going to give it up, right? So in the whole time, not a single of these yellow things got finished, so, you know. They were just growing features and features and features and didn't end. So uh, the good thing was um, that they, they all saw this and observed this. And so it was their own idea to turn the board around by 90 degrees. So what we, they done, did end it, you see that in December, um, they turned around and had a lane per team. And they got rid of the epics and they just had the features um, in, in their team lanes which was really cool because this supported pull from the teams. Before it was proto-push, right? It was like asking for allowance to push stuff into the team so the teams couldn't pull based on the other board. And it was a major, uh, major step forward for them. And it was really cool, like, yeah, it was their own idea and they did it themselves. It was really good. Okay, epic level gone, it was really good. So what else did they learn? So initially they um, put up their systems <coughs> per team, you know, that was the, the order or the verdict we had at the beginning. And uh, we found that the service delivery included a lot of going, you know, through different teams um, back and forth because it wasn't aligned to services, you know, but more like technologies. Um, and they are getting ideas or they had already, it's now they have implemented a few ideas how to evolve the organization to be closer to the service. Like, we had this third program, this Legout program. They just started in, I don't know, late summer or so. And they did something really cool. They did their initial system design based on services. So they did a workshop with the whole program and asked, okay, what are our services? And then they put up the boards per service and let the team self-organize around it. Job done. It was really good without uh, a lot of resistance that we had in the other teams. Um, I was really glad when I left uh, in December, like I did my final tour, and I heard this uh, a lot, like the sentence or slightly um, different, like, we know our journey has just begun. 
And I think it was a big learning for them and a big insight because they had hoped like, yeah, we can tick the box, we're done in November. You know, we're agile and everything is wonderful. But they were well aware that there are a few more topics um, coming up and I think they're driving them. So uh, my learnings, reflections as a coach, briefly. Don't sue me, this is my personal view. Um, safe in Kanban, so I thought, like I was looking for a metaphor, and like, is it a symbiosis? So ah, maybe one is more profiting from the other than the other way around. So I would say Kanban scales without safe, full stop, right? And on the other, on the other hand, Kanban helps to implement the different safe hierarchies. So Kanban is really handy, you know, like this portfolio stuff, you know, you can implement um, this higher level flow. So I would say it's more like this. You know, it's maybe peaceful coexistence. However, there's one really ugly thing about safe and Kanban, which is the approach to change. And that's the thing that also hit us right there. Because, you know, safe, you have this, you know, we have this defined end state and you just need to transition to this state, right? So you have the picture drawn for you already. And with Kanban, we said, you know, start where you are and do evolution. And so this is what we observed, and that's why we had this ditch and, you know, then try to do evolution. So I think really from the change approaches, they're largely in, uh, yeah, they're not uh, compatible with each other. So reflecting back on this, you know, this is like, sometimes it felt like putting a plant on a bit of money and then <laughs> making it grow, you know. So when we started, I think what we had through the safe context, and it could have been like any other reorg, um, like yeah, the, these were the rocks in our way, right? So we had these new structures and lots of leads. We had these enforced new roles. It was really, really bad. Um, it's just like, oh, come on, it's not for us. You know, agility is not for us. And I think what was really bad is that the whole hierarchy wa was overinflated for an organization of that size. You know, we just have 80 people. It's just, I think it's just too much. So we try to be like water, you know, move our way around it and uh, make progress. So what I learned, ask even more questions at the beginning. You know, we uncovered a lot of ugly things, you know, like this role stuff and so on while we're going. If you map your systems to your team structure, you will cement, you know, the team structure and it will take longer to get to a service orientation. I think we didn't have another choice at this uh, point, but if you can start um, working and visualizing on the service level immediately, you know, more services oriented. Evolution in the middle of revolution is, uh, yeah, it's noble, but really, really exhausting. I mean, it was, uh, was not fun. Um, and also what, what was really good, you know, from the beginning, I did a lot of workshops and simulations, you know, building up knowledge helps you to make this whole thing self-sustaining and to really make it stick. Mind the gap. You know, we all love evolutionary change, but it takes time. You know? But not necessarily more coaching. You, know, you don't need to be involved that heavily. Okay, so maybe looking back at the journey briefly. So we started here, up there in December. And the really cool thing is, like, between December and now, they've done a big step forward. And it, I made it blue because it, they did this uh, based on their own capabilities and powers, you know, without any external coaching involvement. And, and, and that's really nice. So I think they're really progressing. They have web limits now on the board and the stuff you see. And I think that's really encouraging. So this could have been the end. I just take one more minute. Let me start it later. And, and maybe if a fairy granted me a wish, I would wish for an alternate beginning or an alternative beginning, you know? So let's rewind once more. Still not getting more pretty. Okay. So. An alternative beginning, you know, imagine it's the beginning of, uh, or the end of 2016 again, you know, and instead of um, deciding to implement this blueprint, this safe blueprint from dev to operations, you know, they could have just said, let's canonize our IT operations services, right? And then, you know, just slowly do it team by team and start with the ones that are most excited or frustrated or whatever, you know, and then just let the whole thing grow gradually and, and see where it takes you, okay? And they would happily pursue evolutionary change ever after. Okay. Thank you.